Episode 282. When you turned the lights on, most of the lights were broken. The lab was dingy and dark. It looks like it got stuck in the 1970s. Their training aid was a 78 Plymouth. There was an old 1960-something television up in the rafters. You know, and so, as Bogie Latner says, she's on our board, and she helped do an audit of the school. And she's like, what message are you sending your future techs when you stick them in this crappy, high, you know, crappy classroom in the back of the school with under-resourced? You're telling them they don't matter. They're not important. This isn't an important or viable career. So we did a makeover. Welcome, aftermarketers, to Remarkable Results Radio. Listen to learn just one thing from today's episode on your journey to remarkable results. Welcome, aftermarketers throughout North America and around the world. Carm Capriato here. Have you ever uttered the words technician shortage? Well, if you have, you're required to listen. This is an important update to the mission of Tech Force as we hear more about the solutions they are bringing to support the need for skilled technicians. Hey, you're with Remarkable Results Radio, the automotive aftermarket's only podcast focused on industry success, trends, insights, and best practices. Your learning curve never sounded so good. This episode features Jennifer Mahar, CEO and Executive Director of Tech Force Foundation. Jennifer sat with me in the Apex 2017 studio to discuss some important updates that you need to hear. This is her second appearance on the podcast. This episode is supported by Federal Mogul Motor Parts. They are the reason you enjoy these interviews twice per week. Search for parts, get the latest technical updates, and sign up for the Garage Rewards Loyalty Program at fmmotorparts.com. And who doesn't like rewards? My social media connections continue to grow. Welcome Scott Wisneski, Al Wright, and Danny Coons to Facebook, and to my new LinkedIn connections, John Marino, Taylor Griffith, and Scott Webb. Find all social links at remarkableresults.biz slash social. Now meet Jennifer Mahar, the CEO and Executive Director of Tech Force Foundation, a nonprofit 501c3 company. See the show notes at remarkableresults.biz slash e282 to find Jennifer's bio, the episode talking points, and important links to get you involved in the program. Yes, getting involved, it, it's going to take a grassroots level of participation to solve our tech shortage problem. We start out the episode with a new set of numbers. The Bureau of Labor Statistics has the projected shortage numbers all wrong. It's three times worse than previous numbers, which has intensified the need to find solutions to this long-term problem. Learn about how you can get involved and also learn about the case studies that were done to prove the grassroots solutions that start in secondary school. Jennifer unveiled the iHub, the industry hub, where resources like talking points, scholarships, videos, and PowerPoints will be housed so you can have access. Go to episode 176, Jennifer's original episode, so you can learn about the entire Future Tech Success campaign. Now, in this episode, find out what you can do to help participate in the grassroots campaign to bring change from the street up. The technician shortage is real, and solving the problem starts with you and me, all of us. Listen to Jennifer frame the purpose of this campaign and how you can help. The episode unveils some very interesting finds, is full of information that you can use, and offers powerful solutions to a much talked about industry challenge. Jennifer Mahar says it best. Here we go. We're here at Apex 2017 in the studio with Jennifer Mahar, the CEO and Executive Director of Tech Force. Hello there. Glad to have you back. Back, yes. Episode 176. Please go look it up, listen to it. It was a great episode. And we really dug deep inside what was going on with Tech Force. And I think you had made, maybe just come on board as the executive director. It was pretty new. I've actually been on board about three years now. But what we were talking about was the brand new initiative of Future Tech Success. And that was, was brand new and exciting. And we had the vision for solving the tech shortage problem. And now we're about one year later. And I'm happy to be here telling you a little bit of the updates of what's been happening. Well, so I interview service professionals, Jennifer. And I send them actually a survey before I do the interview. And I say, what's your biggest passion or concern of the industry? And 80% of them say the tech shortage. Yep. And so sometimes we talk about it. 
because it's the same story over and over again, and I sure don't want to bore my audience. But people like to talk about it because they know it's a looming crisis. It's an issue, even filling the ranks of educators. So we've got some issues. We do. Here's Tech Force. Exactly. Well, Tech Force looked at it and said, we need to be the force that really solves the technician workforce issues, hence the name Tech Force Foundation. And uh, we look at the shortage and said, everybody agrees there is one. Uh, nobody could agree on what the numbers are and how severe it really is. So I'd love to chat with you about some new research we've released this week so that we actually now have numbers, but also was, well, what's the strategy to do anything about it? Yeah, I know, because we could, you know, oh, numbers are cool. Well, it makes me understand this is a real problem. Exactly. But again, what are we doing about it? What's the plan? What's the strategy? What can I do? What can another business do? What can everybody do? So we've got a strategy now, but we also had to start with what What are the real numbers? What? How do you fix anything if you don't even know what success looks like? And how do you fix a problem when you can't even measure what the problem is? So you guys did a study. We I, did. I, I, I'm prepared. <laughs> I read some stuff and, and I was on the plane. I, I was coming here preparing for the interview and there was like a threefold gap in the number. Yeah. So Tech Force released this week um, a new new entrant demand study that gives us the new number of how many auto, diesel, and collision repair techs are really needed by industry so that we have real numbers to start using for projections and planning purposes, but also because since I got here, people said, give me data because I can't hire techs and my, I need my senior leaders to get this and to help give me more resources and understand the problem. But the Bureau of Labor Statistics, which really is the government organization that tracks workforce demand and needs, et cetera, had a number that was low. And we all knew it was low because to say there's 39,000 techs needed, well, I know just a couple of companies that need 39,000 techs collectively. And you think about retiring boomers, et cetera, and the number didn't make sense to any of us, but it was the official number. So long story short, on October 24th of this week, we have been working alongside the BLS to release our numbers, but they have now re-released a new methodology of numbers because they recognize that their methodology had an error. Did they do it on their own or did you ask them to re-look no, at No, they've it? been doing this on their own of looking at how they calculate workforce demand. And they recognize themselves that they were using a number of 2.7, meaning that when my grandpa was in a job, he got hired at 18, and he retired at the same company, probably the same desk at 60, and that was a one churn. And their methodology still assumed that people came into a job and stayed in that job, and it would turn over once. But that is not what we experience today. People have multiple jobs, they're switching careers constantly, and it's only gonna get more so with millennials. So the Bureau of Labor Statistics identified that that calculator in their equation is off and too low. And they've changed it to recognize the comings and goings of people in career and has reset it now at 9%. That is a three-fold increase for all jobs across the country. That is why in the transportation industry, we have been racking our heads trying to understand why their numbers were so low when we had in the real world experiencing such a problem. So the number you were using previous to October 24th was 23,720 need over a 10 year period. And you kept saying, so why are we here? All right, why are we here? It doesn't look like there's a shortage. And now that's the number. 75,900. Right, threefold. So that's right. the real. It's not like demand increased overnight threefold. It's that we now have the real number that shows where we really are. And now we're all nodding. Now, what are we going to do with this information? I mean, Tech Force took the numbers, but we also then focused it just and extrapolated what our supporters and partners need in the industry, which is how does this relate to transportation and vehicle technicians? And we've extrapolated that. And then also we've gone ahead and looked over a 10 year period and given it fluctuations to make it even more meaningful than what the BLS puts out. Okay, so having said all the boring data stuff, why does it matter? Okay, so it matters because number one, we literally have recruiters and employers trying to get resources and help because they're experiencing a demand and even their own companies are like, eh, is it really a big deal? Well, now they have the ammunition to say this is really a big deal. 
Number two is Tech Force Foundation and our future tech success campaign. We're gathering that momentum to continue to argue that education, advocate for CTE in the schools, talking about that these are good jobs that really exist for the future. So how am I supposed to convince schools and educators and parents that these are great jobs that really exist in the future if the numbers don't reflect it? Now the numbers reflect it. I, I want to stop you for a moment, and I want to really impress upon our listener something really important. You're going to hear data and statistics and strategies and tactics and all this stuff, but don't discount it as a listener of this. This is a real crisis. We thought we had a hill. Maybe it was a mountain. Now it's an Everest to get over, and we're all feeling it. And at the end of the discussion in the interview, I believe Jennifer is going to give us, I hope you're going to give us some real actionable items. And I want my listener to realize that they can make a difference. I've been a nonprofit for 25 years. And when you're a nonprofit, you recognize that you're never going to solve an issue or cure a cause unless you collaborate and that you bring in like-minded people and energy and direct all those resources in, uh, to, to solving the problem. This is the disease eating away at our organization. It's the disease eating away at the industry. We do not have enough young people wanting to come into this profession for a myriad of reasons. And we need to start collaborating and joining forces as an industry and show them the possibilities that are around. So I think the hope is that we come up with a plan, at least a way to plug everybody in the industry in. Plug in your passion, you, by just interviewing me and getting the word out. It could be a listener who says, I want to be a mentor to a kid, a future tech. It could be somebody who says, I'll go to speak to a school. Or it could be a business that says, I have leftover training aids. Let's get them out there. Yeah, and, and where is the resource, the site? It's, we're in an electronic world today that I could go on, put it on my desktop, click, and and be directed or get the resources that it takes because today I feel I'm going to go to career day and I, and I want to get the message out. So we're waiting for that centerpiece, if exactly. you will. Exactly, and it hasn't existed. So I always joke, there's lots of great answers and solutions and activities and programs, but they are hidden in the nooks and crannies of this industry. And quite frankly, Tech Force Foundation and the Future Tech Success Campaign, we've said our main goal is to be the hub, to get all of the great resources that are hidden, put them all together in an easy one-stop shop place to find and package it, market it, present it in a way that future techs and their parents and counselors will get. So that if they see a kid who wants to be a future tech or has the interest, they can direct them to futuretechsuccess.org and there's an entire suite of resources. They're not our resources, they're the industry's resources. Videos? Yes, yeah, so learn about the video. Listen to people who started out as techs and then had these amazing careers and you know, going through this lattice of all of these different opportunities it brought. Listen to kids who, from their own mouths, talk about what it was like to be in our country's education system. Sit in the chair, don't touch, don't move, right? And then they feel like they broke free when they got into their hands-on technical education and a job where they are not tied to a desk. And, and imagine and be able to see that there's that career path. But also then you've got a kid that is that hands-on learner and they want to start dappling with automotive or diesel technology again. Where do they go? If you think a mother knows what SEMA is, we're crazy. We're talking to ourselves. We use our own lingo. So how does that mom or dad or that counselor know how to plug that kid in to all of the different after-school programs or technical schools or where do they find scholarships and grants? And, and they all go to Google and research to try and find the answers. We no, need to give them an answer. No, they're not going to Google to find out that I want to be in the automotive aftermarket and turn wrenches. It's and I know I'm wrong on that to a certain degree, but if I was a shop owner, a technician, a distributor, and I knew that I, part of my role in the industry was to start planting some seeds and watering them, is iHub going to be the place that I go for the resources? Yeah. Because I was just invited to career day. I really don't know what to talk about, but that could end up being my major exactly. resource. We have two resources, which are kind of basically the center points. The hub for parents and influencers that help get future techs engaged. All of those resources, a one-stop shop. And that's for the parents and the kids to be able to engage, dapple, 
go to after school programs working on automotive and transportation challenges? Where do they find post secondary or even uh, high schools that have technical programs? All the resources for the parents and the kids. But then we're building iHub, industry hub, because we need to collect all the best resources, the best practices, ways that companies, employers, recruiters can start to better inspire, uh, in, uh, recruit, and retain technicians without having to reinvent that wheel themselves too. So I have employers who are like, do, do you just have a cool video that I could use to excite kids at my local high school? Yes. Go to iHub. Download it for free. Download a flyer, a leave behind. We are coming up with the messaging. We're coming up with the ways to talk to millennials and Gen Z future techs. You just have to grab them and put them into practice. But when you don't have an arsenal, you don't have this toolbox. It's been missing. Yeah. Then you're creating it on your own on a crappy flyer and you're you know showing up on a six-foot table with a handout. And you wonder why the young folks are not excited about our industry. You know that 70% of professional technicians install Moog? Do you know who is best in class in engineering R&D? Do you know who holds 47 patents and has 28 dedicated engineers on staff? Yeah, Moog. You should know that 85% of Moog socket-style components are manufactured in North America, and that makes Moog best in class for manufacturing. And since 1966, every NASCAR championship has been won on Moog parts. But you knew that. I know why you install Moog. They solve your problems. Over the years, Moog has provided problem-solving innovations like a patented pressed-in cover plate, powdered metal gusher-bearing technology, compression-loaded ball joints with a pre-installed integral dust boot, and vertical control arm bushings. You know why you install Moog. Enhanced durability, improved performance, and ease of installation. For more information, go to moogparts.com. Now you know. Being a top technician takes a lot of hard work, and you can't do it alone. I believe you would agree vehicle technologies, repair procedures, and diagnostics are changing every year. That's where Federal Mogul Motor Parts' Guru Garage can help. The Garage Guru's program has been designed by and for technicians and offers the most comprehensive program of support tools in the industry. There's a nationwide network of guru on-site training and technology centers where you can get hands-on training with the equipment and tools needed to solve real work-related challenges. And when you can't make it to on-site training, there's Gurus Online, a 24-7 online academy with a huge catalog of course options. Garage Gurus also helps where it matters most, on the job, in your shop. Their Gurus On The Go technology fleet will they bring the latest products and technology demos right to you. If you need a quick part lookup, the Gurus On Demand app gives you fast, easy, and accurate info. And when you need help with a technical issue, their bilingual ASE certified Gurus On Call are ready to help. And this year, they're introducing their Garage Rewards Loyalty Program, which gets you points towards free gear from your favorite Federal Mogul Motor Parts brands. It costs nothing to join, and you could start earning points immediately. So head on over to fmgaragegurus.com, learn all about the Garage Gurus program, and start earning points today. I've always had this idea of a national day out, okay, from everyone in the industry. Oh, it's a cool idea. And I said, so how are we going to get the PowerPoints or the talking points or the videos that this person would take with them? Download them from my hub. You've answered that That's for right. me. I'm so happy. So now that we've got those resources, we literally can start saying that, uh, in fact, sign on to iHub. I, I'm, I'm, I don't know anything about iHub right now because yeah, it's so new, but I'm to, just go thinking. Go to futuretechsuccess.org and hit iHub. All right, great. Well, you know, my mind is, is that report back to us. Tell us what you've done, where you've gone. We, we want to collect numbers. We want to hear about your reactions. And then we want to see if iHub spikes from the people you're talking to. That would be awesome. Yeah, wouldn't that be neat? Yeah. And so, I mean, at the top of the page, it says, get involved. Right. Oh, great. And that is the clear answer of the only way we're going to fix the tech shortage problem is because industry gets involved. Not just the big guys, everybody. This is an industry made up of small businesses, large businesses, and they all matter, and they all need techs. 
So our rallying cry is that when techs rock, America rolls. And if you want to keep America rolling and your business depends on techs, and quite frankly, my business depends on techs, well, you could be a realtor and depend on techs because you better be able to get around town. You could be Walmart or Target and you depend on techs to get stuff to your stores. So we depend on techs to keep our lives moving and it's time we start loving our techs. So the reality is, is we have to be the solution. Nobody's going to cut one big old check and we're going to change America's perception of technicians because we run some big fancy ad. No, it's going to be grassroots, granular, societal, but it's about getting involved. You can't look at your local community college or your local high school and say, they've got 250, 300 kids in their automotive tech pro automotive program, but it's not my problem. No, it is your problem because if they have a crappy program, what message are we sending? We're saying it's not an important career. It's not, you're not valuable. But if industry is involved locally on the ground, then the kids get the message that there is a career here for them, that there is an industry that needs them, respects them, and wants them. But people want to help, but they don't know how. And that's, again, where the Future Tech Success campaign is saying it's our responsibility as a nonprofit and the champion of techs to make it easy. Your listener wants to be able to go to the website, go into iHub and say, sure, I'll speak to a classroom of students. You tell me when and tell me where, I'll go. But if you're expecting me to figure all this out, I'm busy. i got a business to run. So we're making it easy for them to be able to get involved and make a difference. Just add water. <laughs> That's exactly right. Make it easy. Just add water. <laughs> you said something, after school programs. That interested me. There's a lot of great solutions currently in the industry, Skills USA being obviously one of them. But in addition, there's a lot of kids out there who are our future techs, have that tactile intelligence, but don't know how to plug in. Their school doesn't have a program. So we've looked at it and said, we need to do a couple of things. We need to reinforce the one programs that are out there, make sure their Skills USA has even more students because they can accommodate more, but more just need to know they exist. But also the auto shop programs that exist, are they awesome? Are they thriving or are they hanging on by a thread? If they're hanging on by a thread, we need to pour more resources in them. And then what happens to the kid that doesn't have the school with these programs? Where do they go? That's the after school and summer camp program uh, that we're setting up now by finding partners who already have the kids, already have the ability to help teach and nurture kids. Would a community college, a vocational automotive program fit into that mold? It, it could, okay, because again, they have a site, but when the school bell rings, those bays empty, those classrooms empty, and everybody goes home. But all across America, what happens when those bells ring, whether you're in middle school, high schools, community colleges, is organizations like the Boy yeah, Scouts. You go to clubs, yeah. The Boys and Girls Clubs, the YMCAs, the F, uh, Future Farmers of America, 4-H, those organizations roll in. And I've been, again, nonprofit for 25 years, so I understand how after school and those youth programs work. And frankly, it is easier for us to set up programs with those nonprofit partners when the school bell rings than it is to fight the internal education system, the school districts, trying to get more money and more resources for CTE. We advocate for that. We join forces with ACTE and other organizations trying to work on curriculum in the schools. But that's a very uphill climb. Instead, we look at how do we scale faster and more immediate when you've got merit badges with the Boy Scouts of America around automotive. They've got explorer programs that are looking at workforce and careers. How do we as an industry start to align with those already doing the work and reaching millions of youth and collaborate and infuse our resources to help them do what they're trying to do for the benefit of our industry. So it's that collaboration that we're looking for. So that's why if all of a sudden we start to say overnight, we could start to scale to youth programs in cities with partnerships like that. Well, then where are my industry mentors on the ground? Who could my industry mentor be in Wichita and in Chicago and in Dallas? And that's where your listeners Everyone come into play. In, within the sound of our voices could step to the plate and do this. Now, if, if we've motivated you who is listening to do something, do they just engage with the website? Do they sign up for something? Tell me how someone raises their hand and says, 
I want in. Yeah, well, the fastest way is to raise your hand is go to the futuretechsuccess.org, hit get involved, and register. And reg- uh, okay. okay. Say, I'm willing to be. You know, will you, will, are you willing to donate? Donate 50 bucks, 100 bucks, 1,000 bucks. Are you willing to be a mentor? Are you willing to be a, a public speaker at a high school? So we have all of the different ways we're engaging. Are you willing to donate training aids? Maybe you have the ability to donate training aids. We'll get them to the schools that have the need. So go click the boxes of what you can do. It doesn't matter whether it's one box or multiple boxes. Do something. That puts you into our database so that we can start doing matchmaking. Bingo. I love it. Finally, something. We've been talking about this, that knowing doing gap. We know what we need to do. But we we never, know better, but we don't do better. Yeah, well, we don't do better. We, we don't know how to do. We don't know how to take that first step. And it sure looks like you figured it out. Well, I think we have. And we can do it because we are not-for-profit. And I get that question a lot. Of, We've been talking about this forever, and others have tried. And how are you any different? But being a nonprofit has a lot of power because we are not in it to sell a product. We're not in it for our own brand, which is why schools often close the door. A lot of organizations are fearful that you're coming in for different reasons. And the nonprofit, we are allowed and able to collaborate so much more because we're very much focused on that student and what is the good and the benefit for the tech. And at the same time, with us comes all the people who care and are going to receive the benefits from that. But we're able to kind of speak on that behalf and on a different level. And by getting involved and by doing the things that you are passionate, speaking, uh, in, engaging in, in after school, whatever you feel like you want to do to contribute, you're helping the image of our industry Exactly. Okay, so let me tell you some really fun examples of what we're doing on the ground. All right. All right. So used Phoenix, Arizona as one of our first model cities because you got to walk the talk and prove any of this can work. So we started in our hometown of Phoenix. Not a small market. Pretty robust. Yes. Looked across the entire landscape and started to say we need to find all of our dots. Everything that has anything to do with growing and inspiring and retaining technicians. So you start to find everybody in government who says they care about workforce development. Got it. You look around education, everybody who cares about CTE education, because we all have the same boat to row. You look around and you look at employers, recruiters, everybody who needs to hire technicians, and you say, we all have a common goal. We gathered them together, put them in a room, and nobody knew each other. And you say, well, there you go. That's part of the problem. Oh, really? Right. Because everybody's working in silos. What the government's doing for workforce development, well, they're not helping develop our workforce. So there's the problem. Or CTE education, and they're yelling and advocating for resources, but they're by themselves. And they don't have a big industry like transportation behind them. So what if we actually all got together, beat the same drum, and flexed our muscle? So that's number one. We roll into a community. We put together the Future Tech Workforce Development Council. Got it. Then we identified where are all the schools that are currently up and running to be able to help train future techs, have automotive or diesel programs, et cetera. Both post-secondary and secondary. Correct. Okay. Okay. And again, it's like we have to start looking in the high schools and say, who's doing this? Well, we find that you've got an EVIT, East Valley Institute of Technology. You've got a West Mech in Phoenix, well-known. Then you've got some of the public high schools. You've got Mesa, who has five automotive high schools. Each of those high schools has 300 kids in their automotive program. So, okay, 300 times five. Great. Then I go over to Phoenix School District. They've got Metro Tech and Trevor Brown. Each, again, another 250. Start doing the math, right? Just between EVIT and West Mac and all of these, we've got over 3,000 future techs currently in schools. You're saying there's a shortage. Well, okay, let's start with making sure. I'm really impressed with that number. <laughs> yeah. So they have the interest, right? We looked at those programs. Many of them are already shining stars. You know, so you go into an EVIT and you look at what they've been able to do and you're like, you rock, awesome. What can we do? How can we help make sure you continue to thrive? But we looked on the other end of the equation and we found a school called Trevor Brown. Trevor Brown, Title I school, 97% Hispanic population, walked into that. They did not have an instructor. We're having a difficulty, like difficulty is a nice word, could not find an instructor. Again, problem we're seeing all across the country. 
where are our instructors? And this, again, is issue number two, right? But anyway, we looked at that. I walked in, no instructor, kids head down on the desk, lights out, showing a video. When you turned the lights on, most of the lights were broken. The lab was dingy and dark. It looks like it got stuck in the 1970s. Their training aid was a 78 Plymouth. There was an old 1960-something television up in the rafters. You know, and so, as Bogie Latner says, she's on our board, and she helped do an audit of the school. And she's like, what message are you sending your future techs when you stick them in this crappy, high, you know, crappy classroom in the back of the school with under resource?" You're telling them they don't matter. They're not important. This isn't an important or viable career. So we did a makeover. We rolled in and we literally did a webisode with Bogey and Steve Johnson and George Arents. And they went through and identified everything that didn't work, didn't meet NATEF accreditation. We're working with them to get NATEF accredited and get real live training aids. So to get NATEF accredited, the first thing we asked is, do you know anybody in the community who can serve on your advisory board? Okay, this is Phoenix, not a small town. You've got employers all around you who would love to help these future techs and hire these future techs. Who do you know? No one. No one. You don't know anybody. Well, the schools have not reached out to the community, and yet our industry has not reached out to the schools. Amen. So the disconnect. So we connected them. We immediately put together an advisory committee of that council that I talked about, right? Got them the council, asked our council and our national corporate partners from Advanced Auto Parts and Bridgestone, Nissan, you know, what can you do to help give us supplies? Snap-on rolled in with new toolboxes, uh, Universal Technical Institute with a new training aid of a vehicle. We got two diesel engines. Long story short is, that program is going to be thriving. Did you find the instructor? We found them too. And now they not only have a junior and a senior automotive program, they have a freshman and a sophomore. So it has changed dramatically. So that's what we're looking to do is you get those schools in that market thriving. Then we backed up and said, where's the feeder school to that high school? Where is the feeder middle school? Estrella Middle School was the one where most of the students would come from who would go to then Trevor Brown. We looked and started working with that school to say, where are your tactile learners? Where are the kids who would be excited about automotive? How can we find them, get them excited at an earlier age, get their parents to stop going, ew, what do you want to do that for? And then when we get them excited, It's not a one-hit wonder. We don't go razzle-dazzle, goodbye, never be seen again. We stay with them knowing now we can feed them into a quality program. And then we have the scholarships and grants so that when they're done with the high school, they can go on for post-secondary, and then they can get into the jobs because they're part of this community. That's actually how you solve it, and it's not easy. It's complex, but it's not crazy. But you have a a case study to, to, to talk about. I'm excited to have heard that. So to my listener, if you have a situation like that in your community and you know that they're not doing what you expect them to do, you basically know that it can be done. In order to replicate what you did in Phoenix, we're going to need some more time to get some resources together and get the case study out. Yeah, we have to prove the model works before we really start trying to scale it to other cities. But we are proving that a council works, getting people together. That's right. So the beauty of this whole thing is... Uh, you're, you're moving, you're coming, you're climbing to the top, but get involved. So as you are involved in Tech Force Foundation and more resources come about and, right. and the how to uh, build a community organization that helps these schools, they're going to they're gonna have these resources or at least ideas and concepts down the road. You got to remember, you know, it's a kind of a two part campaign. You have a national umbrella and those tools and resources are available for everybody across the country to plug and play from iHub. So you have to start there. You have to start getting consistent messaging, using best practices, and you know, pushing the story in every nook and cranny of America simultaneously. That you can start doing today. You can't just talk at people nationwide. You have to walk the talk. That's the second layer of a campaign is that grassroots overlay. But you can't do that everywhere all of a sudden until you have a real model that you know works. We've been doing the scattered approach all along. And you, everybody does a little of this and a little of that. 
but it hasn't solved the problem. That's why we have to prove a model that if you go into a community, you have to create a council. You have to have a transportation challenge and curriculum that you can put middle school kids through that gets them excited. And when you get them excited, you better have a feeder school that they can fall into that then can start training them with an environment that tells them this is a great career. I get it. We've got to start a little higher up before we go too deep because if not, there's no career path. Exactly. Yeah, I got it. Cool. Exactly. You've got to come back again in another nine months. We did your episode 176. It was a great intro. This is a fabulous update, but a question. What are we doing to keep the techs we have? Do you, you have any feel on that? Well... That's probably the third leg of the Future Tech Success campaign as we talk about a collective voice and how if, if Tech Force Foundation is truly going to be a champion for technicians, how do we start having some of the tough conversations about the issues that are really impeding our ability to attract, retain, and keep techs? Not everybody wants to have that conversation, but if you're being real and authentic to the cause, then we got to start having it. We talk about it a lot on the show. Um, there's a lot of ownership responsibility here. Work environment, pay, benefits. Tools. To, yes. Uh, we've done shows on all of that. And collectively, maybe we can actually move that retention piece up. I also think it's a role for Tech Force Foundation because it's not always popular to talk about those issues. And therefore, a lot of brands don't want to be the one to stick their neck out and champion the issue but as a not-for-profit if people get mad at tech force for doing it they're getting mad at us for doing the mission which ultimately really is just trying to help them with their bottom line so it's really our cause du jour that we have to start advocating for for the good of everybody but it gives all of our corporate partners and our small businesses, I guess, certain amount of shielding of not having to stick, stick their own neck out, but be part of a collective voice that says, yeah, you're right, this is kind of crazy. One more time, the website to go to? FutureTechSuccess.org. Click on the I want to get involved button? Get involved. Get involved. We'll put the address on the website's show notes page. Will you come back and give us another update and say nine months? Anytime, any day. Jennifer Mahar, Executive Director and uh, President of Tech Force Foundation. Hey, thanks, Jennifer Mahar from Tech Force and the Future Tech Success Campaign. I believe you heard a great update to the program and movement to recruit and find solutions to tackle the technician shortage. Jennifer's original episode is 176, and you can find the link to that and the talking points for this episode at remarkableresults.biz slash e282. Hey, also on the show page is the link where you can submit your name to get involved. I've done it, and I suggest you do. Hey, thanks. Please share this episode. I want the entire industry to have a chance to listen and learn from Jennifer Mahar and the good work they're doing at Tech Force. Hey, thanks, and talk soon. <music> Thanks for being on board to listen and learn from the premier automotive aftermarket podcast. Until next time.